when I was a kid, maybe seven, eight years old, and we were on vacation near Innsbruck. And all of a sudden, we're, you know, we're in this, I guess a boarding house is what you'd call it, mostly Jewish people. It happens to be, you know, one of those. Uh, yeah, because my mother was strictly kosher, and I think my brother and I and she were there. And, you know, Grandpa wasn't, because, you know, it was vacation and he was working. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, we were woken up by gunfire. So here we are, you know, they're herding us all down into the cellar. You know, and everybody's got their own ideas of what to do. And, you know, one is stuffing pillows into the windows in the cellar and all this. And there we were all night, and gunfire all night. And this was one of the first excursions of uh, Germans or Nazis fighting with the Austrian troops. You know, it was like several years later that actually the Anschluss took place, which was the Germany just moved in. You know, what Oh, God, I can't remember the dates worth of the end. I was born in 26. Yeah, that sounds, I was going to guess it, about 1938. But it was like, there was political unrest in Austria uh, on and off for quite a while. I remember two hours again, a little kid, and they were actually shooting cannons off at housing projects. And this, you know, I, I can't even recall what the political problem was. But there was always this attempt to unseat one party and get into another one. And, you know, and of course, Bubby was a great panicker. You know, whenever anything it sounded like, you know, she'd stock up on candles and all of this stuff. And, you know, th those are the things you remember. You really didn't know what the hell was going on at my age. But all I remember is, you know, they're talking strike you know, a general strike and, and, you know, and all this kind of jazz. And then you would hear the cannons booming, even, even in Vienna. And of course, where we lived was a residential neighborhood. We lived in an apartment building about uh, four or five stories. And there was a cousin of ours living in the same building. Were the Jewish people in the building? No, no. It, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a ghetto area. It was a good mix. Uh, in fact, the district, uh, the Bezirk, as they call it, in which we lived, was not the predominantly Jewish one, but there were uh, enough there so that there were synagogues like uh, six, seven blocks away was one, and there was another one which was almost attached to a house in which Uncle Leo lived. And when my grandfather came to Vienna. He first lived with us for a while, and then he went and lived with Leo. And of course, it was convenient as hell for him. He was able to get, you know, right into the synagogue. Of course, when the Anschluss took place, and, you know, they started burning synagogues, then it wasn't such a good location anymore. Anschluss? What that mean? That was the takeover. Anschluss actually means lock on. No, no, not onslaught. Anschluss uh, locking on. No, it's, they just locked it on to Germany. And, you know, it was amazing how, you know, how peaceful really it was from where we sat. It was like a parade. I, you, you, I remember going down and watching the German troops and just continuously they were moving in. And, of course, the significant thing that they had that, you know, surprised the whole world was that they were mobilized. Motorcycles, coming out of your ears. There were, you know, there wasn't a working, a walking soldier that we saw. It was all going through the main arteries and we didn't live too far away from the main artery. They just kept coming. And, you know, day and night they were going, going, and going. And we had some warning, a couple of, uh, well, I guess they took Czechoslovakia first, didn't they? And then they took Austria. No, Poland was last. Poland was what started the war. Poland is when the war really started. See, Germany took Austria without a fight, which in a way was, was good, but it was uh, all part of uh, Chamberlain was negotiating, you know, the English foreign minister 
And, you know, he, his big mistake was, well, he was politically naive as could be. They thought they could negotiate with, uh, with Hitler and his guys. And Austria was one of the prizes they were willing to give up. So, of course, when it first started, you know, every, nobody really, and that was the problem, too, in, in, I don't know if this Holocaust really implied this, but the problem even in Germany was that originally the Jews didn't believe that, you know, that this was going to be a problem. Did they? Yeah. Up until they went into the yeah. But because who would believe that they were going to, who would think that they were going to destroy every Jew in Europe? I mean, people at the office kept saying, why didn't they fight? Well, who would think that that was going to happen? I mean, you mm -hmm. got to hope that it's not true. Well, the, you know, the things that, that took place, some of them were very, you know, small little things. And, you know, you tell funny little stories. And, in fact, you know, we kept telling stories about it, you know, and, it didn't affect the lives that much at the outset. And we hadn't heard anything about what was going on in Germany. You know, there was, you knew something, but it wasn't, you know, nobody really expected the thing to take the turn of events. And, of course, some of the things, the first major indication we had was that they weren't messing around was uh, my brother got hit over the head with an iron bar one day, you know, because he was in some club with kids. I don't know, they came in and started busting heads. Now, of course, they kept taking guys. You know, every now and then somebody in the neighborhood would disappear. The first thing that they did, really, that was significant was appropriate property. And you know, I'll never forget, probably the biggest heartbreak of my childhood was when I saw our car, which was garaged like a block and a half away from where we were. And we had a chauffeur. And, you know, and, and whenever he was in the neighborhood, uh, I would, you know, he would always make it a point to grab me and, you know, I'd go for a ride with him and then walk back. And all of a sudden, I see the car going down the street and I'm running after it. You know, I can remember this like it was yesterday. And my heart was tearing up because I'm howling and screaming and the car isn't stopping. And the car was gone. And, you know, that's when I realized that, hey, you know, this is the way this thing operates. So my brother got beat over the head, and then we finally managed to get him out of the country first. So now we started to try and get out quite a long time. Well, that was the problem. There weren't a hell of a lot of places that you could go to. The United States was our goal because my father's family was here. You know, he had brothers and sisters here, and my aunt and uncle, well, my aunt, my mother's sister was also here. So it was on my father's family and on my mother's family that we had people here. And uh, the problem, though, was that the United States immigration laws are pretty restrictive. The quota business, okay? And they went on the basis not of what your citizenship was, but on where you were born. So our quota wound up to be Polish because most my mother and father were born in what was at that point considered to be Poland. So we had, you know, we knew we were going to have to wait two, three years. So you try to stay the hell out of the mainstream, but it didn't work. My father lost his business because uh, they just... He had a clothing manufacturing. He was a manufacturer and wholesaler. And uh, Cousin Jack worked for him. Yeah, well, they just, you know, I don't know exactly what the details were, but one day that was it. He just didn't have the business anymore. I got kicked out of school. Uh, you know, the school I was going to was, uh, okay, the school system was different than here. Four years of school were the same for everybody. You know, you had a public school, like grade school. But then they split you up into either the gymnasium, they called it, the uh, gymnasium, or the public school. Now, the kids that didn't go to gymnasium, and I think money was involved, uh, they went another four years, and that was it. So they had a total of eight years of schooling. The kids in gymnasium went to uh, eight years after th when they started. So I was in my first or second year in the <coughs> gymnasium, and when they took over, 
you know, the, one of the things that came up after a while was you know, Jewish kids could not keep going to the gymnasium. There was a park right a half a block from where we lived. A tremendous park. At one time, it was one of the royal estates. And it was really, in fact, there's a picture of one of my cousins, a couple of my cousins in that park, and you can see, you know, tree-lined lanes for like miles, literally. One of the things they did one day was, you know, they grabbed a couple of Jews and got some paint and, you know, the the insult of it, you know, they really were masters at, at making you, you know, suffer. Took a couple of Jews and made them paint Juden verboten, you know, in front of the, uh, the park gate. And it's, Jews were no longer allowed to go into the park. Uh, one of the cute little stories, in fact, I just told it the other night at dinner because I was out with a guy from the United Kingdom and a couple of guys, and they were talking about the the uh, TV thing, about, you know, how they used to put this on the stores, you know, like the, this is an Aryan store and, uh, you know, only Aryans will be sold and, you know, and all this. And it seems this little Jewish guy had a little store in between two big department stores. So they put these big signs up, you know, Aryans welcome, and, you know, this is a totally German store and all this. Well, they couldn't use German. It was just said Aryan, which meant of the German uh, or the uh, Nordic race. Uh, Aryan, I can't translate it, but that's what they, that was the word they used because, you know, in Austria, they were Austrians, so they couldn't say they were Germans. But if they were Aryans, which meant to s exactly, I th no, I you know that that's one of the things I guess more and more people are realizing that they didn't just go after the Jews; they went anybody that anybody that wasn't Nordic. The Russians, yeah, the Russians. Polish and the Czechoslovakians they got raked over pretty good too. The Hungarians. Well, anyway, so here's this picture. This you know, here's this little Jewish store with these two big stores with the signs Aryans and you know. And, so what does he do? I mean, his business is going down the drain terribly. So he thinks a while, what can he do? He gets himself a sign, and he writes a little sign that says, Main Entrance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stories like that, where, you know, the, uh, they're told about Goebbels, or somebody wanted to do something, you know, for the Jews in a, in a fit of passion one time. It seems he was riding an airplane. And one of the guys said, well, step out. <laughs> uh those kinds of little stories. But anyway, let's see. If, if, if Beatty lost his business, what were you living on? Bathing? Did yeah. Did take that from you yet? Not yet, no. That, that came... The biggest day of infamy in Austria was, I think it was November 10, and it, it came up in, that, uh, in the TV program, apparently. This was a day... I guess there was some political ass uh, assault on one of the... Von Papen? Uh, no, he was a, the diplomat, right. And they somehow chose to blame that on the Jews and really started a mass roundup. And one of my uncles got picked up. And we never saw him again. And that was Ozzy's father. Max, Uncle Max, uh, and we we heard later how they knew or what I don't know, but we heard almost the next day that he was dead. You know, some guy just whipped out a pistol and let him have it. And this guy was the kind of guy that he wouldn't hurt a fly, and he wouldn't raise his voice to anybody. But it just took you know this young squirt got the got the urge and he let him have it. My father was a Purple Heart veteran from World War II. And he had... One. one. Sorry, one. And he had the scars to prove it. He had two big holes in his, in his back where a piece of shrapnel had entered and come out. And, you know, they, they were coming to the door like, you know, there was wave after wave after wave. And everybody w became a... You know, all of a sudden they... It was a free-for-all is what the hell it was. Anybody that wanted to go plunder or wanted to go attack a Jew, they could do it at any time. Uh, 
November 10th, I think, was the date. It could be. It could be. I, it was, you know, it was throughout Germany and Austria. And it was just, it started. I mean, they just needed an excuse, really. Because they were doing some of this even before. Uncle Leo, fortunately, for some reason or other, had not changed his citizenship to Austrian. Um. From Polish. So he was still a Polish citizen. You know, it's amazing that the things people did to try to avoid arrest or being hassled. So they had the insignia, I guess, of the seal of Poland. And they stapled that on their door. You know, and it apparently got them through the thing. So when these guys would come to our house, of course, you got to remember, my brother now, he's already in Germany, I think or he's living in a kibbutz somewhere in either in Austria or in Germany preparatory to trying to get to Israel, which incidentally he never made. He wound up in England and then was transferred to Canada during the war because England didn't trust him. So he was a, you know, he was an Austrian. I mean, the fact that he was Jewish and you know, on his way to Israel, somehow they couldn't hang that together. They could have used you know people there to help with the war effort and whatever, but no, they interned them and shipped them to Canada along with your Uncle Philip, whom you may or, not, may or may not remember. No, he lived in Waterbury. He lived until... How was he in? He was Sally's brother and Mom's br and Bubby's brother. Okay, so... What these you guys... Hear? You know, it. it's funny. Scared sometimes, mad a lot of times. You know, when when little kids, you know, you walk by and the kids would attack you and spit at you, and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff, and and you didn't dare. And this is what we would did we did wrong. Didn't dare raise a hand to fight back. But you know, the odds were overwhelming. In a way, I I don't think you could have done anything unless we were somehow helped by the outside given weapons and that kind of stuff. But, you know, if anybody got caught with a weapon, God, you know, that was the end right then and there. And they didn't need any excuses. I mean, they would take the mildest people and, you know, and embarrass them and, you know, and, and really the the psychological hurt as well as the physical hurt was unbelievable that they would inflict on you. So scared, I, I maybe we were too numb. Uh, maybe we were, I don't know. Yeah, they were plenty of times you were scared but at that age I think a kid is scared about everything so you know, I really don't but when these people started coming to the house and everybody got into the act one there was a grocer downstairs in our apartment building small little grocery and we didn't buy that much from him I used to go in there and get something and put it on the tab and then my mother would have to pay it never wanted to eat in the house but downstairs you know while I was playing, I'd get the urge to have a, a stolle, you know, one of these sweet rolls with butter on it. You know, I had it down there. He came to the house looking for valuables. And we had valuables in the house. You know, some of my mother's jewelry, we, you know, we hid it in the Pacific dishes, in the Passover dishes. You know, she had a, a cadenza like in the dining room. And she had, you know, it was foolish in a way. What we had done was we had distributed. There was cash in the house. There was valuables, dishes, uh, silverware, and of course jewelry. She had you know, substantial amount of jewelry, various pieces. So we hid the jewelry in one of the pots, you know, where the Passover dishes were, in deep in there. And this guy comes up, and it's funny. You know, there were lots of them that went through the house looking for valuables. No, no. They were all Nazis. You know, they'd get an armband or a half a uniform, you know, put on a brown tie, and you're a Nazi. You know, if you're not Jewish, you were a Nazi. I mean, and, and actually, there were people going around like, well, here, this guy from downstairs, you know, he was the, he knew us. And my mother had unbelievable control in some of these situations. It really, you know, you never saw that side of her fantastic this guy comes up goes over to that cabinet and oh another thing you got to know about in the old country 
Everything is locked. You know, you had a closed closet, it was locked. You had to have a key to open everything. So he goes over and he's looking for valuables. And these were two other guys. So he goes and he yanks on the door to this cabinet. And she says, uh, Herr Weber, you don't have to tear the cabinets open. I've got keys. Wait a minute, I'll give you the keys. And this is the cabinet where the hell most of the stuff is hidden. When he heard that, he, lost, he walked away from that cabinet and took the keys from her and started looking in other places. So she got him away from there. So he finally found something because they had spotted stuff around. I think it was uh, something else of some value. I've forgotten what. And she had the audacity to say to him, I know you know who we are and we know who you are, so I'm sure you wouldn't mind signing a receipt for this. And you know, the guy gave her a receipt for this stuff. Because we never saw it again. <laughs> but the fact is that, you know, she got him to give her a receipt. Well, every one of these groups, when they couldn't get any valuables or anything, the next thing was to take the head of the household, you know, take a Jew. And kids, for some reason or other, they didn't take. So we were glad my brother wasn't home because he would have been a goner. So they, each one of them wants to take my grand, my father. And he had the regular routine down. He would tell them that he was a World War One veteran and he had fought for the country and that he deserved some consideration. And they said, uh, what do you mean? And he would say, wait a minute, you want to see? And he'd drop his pants and show him his injury. And it worked. There must have been five groups that came and every one of them let him go. The sixth group came, didn't ask for valuables or anything. They came for him. And to this day, you know, I remember that everybody knew that he was sent for by somebody that hated him specifically. Now, none of the people, the three guys that came, he knew. But we suspect that very strongly that it got to have been somebody that either in business or something had a particular hate for him and said, you know, you got to get this Jew, too. And they came and got him, and he spent, you know, he told me about, it. you know, they, they had made a storage area for him in one, of the, in one of the schools I had gone to. And they literally, you know, slept wherever they could. And in order to turn over, in the middle, you had to stand up, turn around and lay down again because it was so crowded with people. They almost had layers of them. You know, they didn't know what to do with them. They rounded up almost every Jewish male they could find. And a lot of them never got home. For some reason or other, my father was lucky, and he got back home. In about, in about five days, he was back. But for the five days, we didn't have the foggiest notion of where the hell he was, what was going on, and my guess is that the injury got him out again. They were looking, in those days, still mostly, for really able-bodied guys. Why, I, you know, I don't know, because you know, the rumor had it that they were going to have them build munitions and fortifications and all of this. But they just, you know, we were trying, and my father, of course, came home, and he was a, you know, from then on, he was a, you know, an invalid. You know, he was really in tough shape. He was afraid. He was literally, you know, afraid to move. He wouldn't move out of the house. He was in bed a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, we tried to find a way out. So now, how do you get out? Well, the United States had the quota. So then you could go to Cuba in those days, I think, Trinidad, places like, you know, free ports, if you could afford to, you know, make a down payment and buy the tickets and all of this. Well, I don't know, for some reason... Uh, the this is 39, roughly. So the war is Poland? No. No. No, the war, the war with Poland and, you know, the invasion of Poland really took place while we were in Latvia. But what was interesting about that, you know, the little things that happened along the way. Uh, my father, you know, the objective was to get the mail out first. You know, the, the old guy. So because we couldn't get it all together, I, he went first. 
my mother and I stayed behind, and then about four or five months later, I went to Latvia. Yeah. And I can't remember exactly why we couldn't all go at the same time, but my guess is it had something to do with taxes and accumulation of cash and all of this kind of stuff. And, oh, well, yeah, in, let's take the important stuff, which was trying to get out of there. So now in the meantime, the American Council is closed up again. So now the only way we can stay in touch is by, you know, writing and we finally our quota comes up and now the question is how do you get to the United States if you can't cross the Atlantic so we went the other way so we traded our ship tickets and negotiated all kinds of deals made arrangements to stop in Moscow so we left we went from Latvia to Moscow, spent better than a week in Moscow working with the American consulate, trying to get, you know, get our visas and stuff squared away. And when do we wind up in Moscow? At the time of the celebration of the revolution, which is in November or something or other. And, you know, you see this to this day, you see those parades. Well, we had a hotel where we had like a front row seat to this parade. Russia is not a pleasant place to live. It wasn't then. I'm sure it is not today. People are afraid of their shadows. It's, you know, it's like Hitlerism. Only everybody is afraid in a sense. That is questionable. It's hard to say because I'm not sure what we saw in Russia wasn't staged for us to some extent. In fact, I'm convinced some of it was. We were in the week we were there, we were invited to dinner at some place. We never got it, uh, to see a synagogue. But we did get to this Jewish family. And the way they live, you know, you wouldn't consider it living here. On the other hand, we ran into a Jewish guy who was one of the room clerks or something in the hotel, and he was almost afraid to talk to us. You know, Zadie identified himself as a Jewish guy, and he asked him, are you Jewish? And the guy said, uh, does it matter or something like that? You know, and he was absolutely afraid to talk to us for fear that he would get associated with foreigners or something. Yet this one couple, and I don't know how, I can't remember how we dug them up, but we're convinced that that was the propaganda attempt. Now, they took us there, they fed us a meal, and they said, you know, how good things were and all of that. Uh, but even what they showed us, they shared, they had room, I guess they had two rooms, but the kitchen they shared and the bathroom they shared with like three other families. You know, really crowded conditions, nothing like what Latvia was. And one of the things that, you know, they had these markets in Latvia that you went to. I suppose our supermarkets here was, was sometimes, but it was like a farmer's market, you know, and you'd go and there were these big, tremendous halls. And I remember you used to see butter and kegs this big. You know, unbelievable. And the finest foods you can imagine. It was all readily available because... It was a port, and all this stuff was being brought in and shipped out and so forth. But Latvia really was a, a great country, and I spent, my father spent time, you know, you, you go crazy because you couldn't work, and, you know, didn't have to work in a sense. So he was mostly involved in synagogue. You know, he'd go to services, and I'd go with him. Two, you know, twice a day. And I ran into a kid, I'll never forget this, and that's how I made my friends. When my brother and I were growing up in Vienna, he was interested in the Zionist movement. 
So he belonged to one of these clubs. It was like a scout troop, only it was a Jewish Zionist club. And somewhat left-wing, I found out subsequently. So he... And they had this insignia. Well, I'm in show one day, and I look around, and there's this young boy saying Kaddish. And he's got an insignia on that looks familiar. Well, I thought, so I went up to him and I started a conversation. Now, you got to remember, this is interesting as hell. These kids in Latvia spoke three languages fluently, usually. They spoke Latvian, they spoke Hebrew, Yiddish, and sometimes German. At least three, if not four languages. Sometimes five. But Hebrew... Now, the other thing is that the schools were all almost parochial schools. A lot of the kids went to, uh, you know, Hebrew schools. And in this youth group, which I later joined, you know, he invited me, you know, he told everybody how I recognized the insignia. And I remember him telling that in Hebrew, and I understood some of the words, but not many. You know, he took me in, and he says, you know, how I got to meet the guy, he recognized my uh, insignia, and he said it in Hebrew, and I can't remember the Hebrew word, but I can remember that, you know, I can hear the ring of his words telling him. That was a live group, and I went, you know, they went on campouts in Latvia, you know. I spent my 18 months, a uh, good part of the 18 months in Latvia, going to trade school, because I couldn't go to an academic school, so I decided I'd learn to be an electrician. Well, there to be an electrician, you also got to know how to do metalworking, and that was my first exposure to metalworking. I also met an old German gentleman who found out he was Jewish when, uh, when Hitler came. I guess he lived in Germany somewhere, who was an engineer. And that was my first exposure to engineering because this guy didn't have what to do and took a liking to me as a kid. So I'd go to his house where he was renting a room, and we'd sit and, he'd, you know, I got a technical manual that I bought in Latvia, in German, that he suggested I have, like a handbook, you know, of tables and, and formula and stuff like that. And I worked with him, you know, he'd show me things, and I learned a little drafting, and I went to this trade school. And, of course, I had my bar mitzvah there. And the big bar mitzvah was that, uh, you know, I had, I think, what, two dinner guests. You know, that was the bar, my bar mitzvah. My mother, my father, and two guys from the shul that we knew came up, and my mother made some gefilte fish, and that was my bar mitzvah. You know, I got called to the Torah, and that was it. And I was lucky I did that. And then we left. Well, okay, so we finally... Moscow and from Moscow we took the Trans-Siberian Railroad which is you know a fabulous sort of a thing it's uh, five days and six nights on a train across Russia all the way from Moscow to Asia to the border of Manchuria in Russia in those days and crossing some of those but well the trip across Russia was interesting though somewhat you know uneventful in terms of oh there was some cute little things going on there was another Jewish family Germans a mother and a young boy and a daughter and they were again you know they they found out they were Jewish when Hitler came in and they, I don't know where the hell they were heading, but they were on this train, and this young Russian officer gets on. And pretty soon the daughter and the Russian officer are having themselves a good time. And he was, yeah, and Russia had not entered the war against Germany at this point. But they were ready. And that was, you know, the, the Russian officer at one point was saying, oh, the Germans aren't going to bother us because they know we're going to break their neck. You know, I, I can remember him sitting in the cabin, and he had had an injured hand. He was apparently a flyer or something and had been injured, and 
One of his hands was a little deformed. I remember he was, you know, showed how he was going to break their necks, the Germans. And of course, being on a train for that long, and now you got to remember my mother strictly kosher. All this whole time she's trying to keep kosher. All this whole time she's trying to keep kosher. We brought food. Oh, and I in in Moscow, I had to go get the the GIs, and I really had a bad case of it because we were eating in the room you know i would go down and eat every now and then and i you know trying to get a doctor and this is just before the parade you know and i was really sick and of course the bathroom was still you know three blocks down the hall i you know and for a little kid I was 13, but, you know, not much after 13. It was really horrible. I, I can't remember ever being that sick. And they finally got a doctor, and guess what, how they cured me? They gave me a dose of castor oil, which I'd never taken in my life. But, you know, that apparently, you know, the, the horse remedies still work, you know. So we get to the border between Russia and Manchuria, and now you find out how different, you know, how much animosity there was in that area. And now you're not dealing with Europeans anymore. I mean, most of the people are Chinese, Mongolian, this kind of, and you know, we're standing. And all this is going on around us. And oh, some things I got to tell you about. You know, the Russian economy. One of the things that happened in Latvia after, you know, the land of good and plenty, the minute the Russian soldiers came in, they had plenty of money. They bought up everything. All of a sudden, everything was short. You couldn't get shoes, you couldn't get clothes, you couldn't get anything. But I did have a bar mitzvah suit. In Moscow, in order to subsist, and for some reason it took longer to get things arranged, we sold my bar mitzvah suit to a state store. Now, this wasn't, you know, an illegal thing. They had stores in which you sold used clothing, and the state was running it. In fact, the state was running goddamn near everything. People would stand in line for a loaf of bread in Moscow. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were going hungry, but it was just that, you know, everything you had to line up for. There isn't enough merchandise and enough stores to just go in and buy what you want. We, we got 700 rubles for that one suit. And that one suit, man, was, you know, that, that 700 rubles was worth a lot of scratch. What was a ruble worth? At that time, the ruble was worth uh, 30, 40 cents. But in their, no, it wasn't, in, in, in their economy, though, it was worth a hell of a lot more. We could have lived in Moscow for probably four or five weeks. I think we used those rules to upgrade our tickets on the train. We bought sleeping car arrangements. We bought some uh, diner tickets because, you know, I was I'd go into the dining car. I couldn't eat. We had... 17 large packages and 13 small packages when we got on in you Riga. Were yeah, when we got on in Riga. You know, we were like a, <laughs> a disaster area all in ourselves. You know, <laughs> when they unloaded us, and I'll tell you how these things happened, uh, it was like, you know, we had all we could do to keep track of all our damn packages. And a lot of it was food. We carried like four big bags full of food. You know, we had loaves of black bread. To be kosher. Yeah, to be kosher, you know, and tins of sardines and cheeses and, you know, all this stuff. And that's, you know, that's how others do it too, though. You know, in Europe, this is not uncommon to see people dig into their bag and come up and eat, you know, out of the... Well, we crossed over, I mean, well, we finally got across the border, but standing there with all these packages and all these natives who looked dirty and diseased, one of the ways they were going to keep me from getting germs, I started to smoke. 
I had already smoked, but your grandparents <laughs> didn't know that. But in order to ward off those bad germs, you know, I, I took some cigarettes and we smoked. Seriously? Seriously. That was your old life? Yeah. Well, who the hell knows? Probably pretty very healthy. Yeah. <laughs> We went, we went down. We went down Manchuria into Korea. You were in Korea? Well, it's, it's, in those days it wasn't known as Korea. It was Manchuria, but it, yeah, you're right. It's, it's the same country. People were, you know, the, it changed again. It changed makeup during World War II. That, you know, you can't even rec I got to go back to the old maps in order to tell you where I went. But what was interesting was that, you know, I was the guy that was guiding. I had the map. I was, I spoke a little English. I spoke a little of this. You know, and I'm leading my folks around. You're a little kid. Well, you know, at 14, I mean, you can almost see it happening and being, you know, being possible because, you know, you get a bright kid like that and you can do it. All right, let's hope you don't have to lead us around anywhere. But at any, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at the map, and our destination is Japan, because we're taking a ship from Yokohama to San Francisco. In looking at the map, I found that there are two ways to go to Japan from you know, where we were. One looks like about a six-hour trip, another one like a three-day trip you know, on, a second sh on another ship, like almost a, a ferry boat. You know, you read about those ferries sinking now and then in the Sea of Japan and in that whole area. So we decide we're going to take the six-hour one. So we go all the way down from, and when I first got here, and I got copies of this, I wrote, I wrote some themes on this, you know, for school, and they got published in the papers. So, you know, Fusan was the name of one of the ports. Fusan to someplace in Japan was six hours. So, you know, we go down there, we get on the ship, get all the way across into Japan, and some Jap starts raising the holy hell with us. You know, here we are standing in the middle of a port, you know, with all these guardian packages around us. And he's unhappy about something. Well, when we get all through, we finally find out what the problem is, that our passport visa, the entrance did not provide for us coming this way. So what do those bastards do? Load us back on that ship ship us back across another six hours on that ocean. Now, you got to remember, Bubby is not the best traveler in the world, okay? So, you know, we're getting back. Now, then we start to wind our way back up, trying to... Uh, you know, I think there's a better map than this around here. Well, you can't map. Yeah. Well... We wind our way back up, and all of a sudden, and there was two countries. It was Manchuria and something else, because all of a sudden, yeah, Korea and Manchuria. Manchuka. Okay, Manchuka. Here. We get to the border of Korea, and all of a sudden, we're in trouble again. They throw us off the day. We're on our way someplace, and I can't remember exactly what the facts were. But we were heading back to get a better view. Oh, that must have been it. We must have gone someplace to get the visa straightened out. They yank us off the train at some border. And one of these guys, and these, you know, you're dealing with all guys in uniform, and no, absolute no way of communication. Finally, one of the guys comes up with a dictionary, takes a piece of chalk, and writes on the sidewalk, you know, in the middle of the train depot, Stehen, which means German for stand, or standing. That was the total amount of 
the communication. And I don't, you know, it, it meant that we couldn't go anywhere. We had to stay where we were. And we finally persuaded them, and they took us, and that's in that article, they took us to this hotel, which was a Korean or Japanese hotel, and, the, you know, I wrote a theme on it because, you know, it was a real experience. Up to now, we had only been in, you know, European stuff. Now, all of a sudden, we're in this place, and it's strictly Oriental. The pillow is about this big and filled with rice. You know, that's in the bedroom. Well, we stayed overnight there, and then the next day we... on. Oh, Jeff, the wine is really doing a number on you, huh? Jeff could go to sleep now without any trouble at all, huh? Would you like to? You don't have to stay awake, Jeff. I'll forgive you. It'll be taped. <laughs> Anywho, we finally... Well, they, you know, finally, uh, I guess some higher officer came along and somehow they communicated by using the dictionary. And the gist of it was that we had used the wrong visa, we had to go all the way back, and we wound up going back into Manchuria again. North, okay? Into a town called Mugden. And we wind up spending... Six weeks and moved in. Getting all these crazy visas straightened out. Yeah, we had a, you know we had to straighten it out with Japan. We had to straighten it out with Korea. We had to straighten it out with Manchuria. In the meantime, we're worried our visas to the United States are going to run out, and then we got to change the damn. We now missed the connection. We had to get a new ship arrangement. Again, we found some Jewish people in Manchuria, in Mukden, believe it or not. Now, these were white Russians. White Russians meaning Russians who ran away from the Red Russians, the communists. And they, were, they were all over that area. They were all over Latvia, Estonia, and they were also on this side. And these people really treated us royally, too. We stayed in what was the Jewish community library for six weeks in Manchuria. And we ate some of the finest foods that you want to believe. You know, those people were living well. They had by now re, you know, regained some of their wealth. They had saved some of their wealth were merchants and so forth, and they had a community. The librarian, I'll never forget, an elderly, lonely gentleman who used to drink himself to, to sleep every afternoon. He lived, in, he lived upstairs from the library. He had a, a Chinese or Nigerian or Korean, I don't know what nationality, an Asian uh, helper who cooked, kept the place clean and who helped my mother, and my mother used the kitchen there. And this was the first time she started to eat non-kosher meat. We would go to the market, and you know, they, the Chinese market was something else. You know, you'd buy live chickens, and the guy would slit the chicken's throat right there. And what they do is, you know, they, they bend the neck back like this and let the chicken go, and the chicken runs around until it dies. And, and this is, you know, and Bubby used to complain, but, you know, after a while, you just had to eat something. You know, we, we knew we were stuck there. So chicken was one of the things she would eat, and this guy, and we would get invited out to eat. And it was really amazing. Imagine a kitchen no larger than our breakfast nook. That's where these Chinese guys used to cook for the most sumptuous meals that you can imagine. For eight people, ten people, but in kitchens that big, which was also partly the pantry. And these guys were absolutely fabulous cooks. But Mugden, you know, you got to see a different civilization. The difference between wealth and poor was 
pronounced. Some of those people would die and the body would lie on a street for days on end. Right where the person dropped and died. You know, nobody would claim them, nobody would pick them up. The sanitation facilities weren't the greatest. Though some of the people, and mostly the Japanese, were very clean. Used to travel with towels all the time. And they always wash them and carry their own towels. Uh, Well, I got to read in the, in the library. I slept on two chairs like this. We'd move them together, and I made a board that straddled the two chairs. I took one of the pillows off of one of the other things, and I put it in between, and that was my bed for six weeks. Well, in Latvia, I, I didn't have a bed. There was... Uh, the room we rented in the last place where we stayed had like a couch and a divan and a bench slide. And it was that bench on which I slept for, you know, maybe a year that we lived in it. And, you know, that, hey, I had the best bed. Hmm. So we finally got our papers in order and went back through Korea into Japan to get our ship to go to the States. And we landed in Kobe in Japan, spent some time there. Excuse me, was, was the war between Japan and the United States? No, wait, 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 no. We'll tell you about this okay. in a minute. No, that's, so we, you know, from Kobe we went to Yokohama, which is right outside of Tokyo, really, and is the port outside of Tokyo. And we took the train to do that through Japan, again, with all these packages. And you gotta, you can't imagine three people, you know, one a woman, trying to get all this stuff on and off the, you know, well, in those days, women didn't have the muscles they got today. <laughs> some of which they have to support. <laughs> uh, uh, Tokyo is a beautiful city. Kobe, also very beautiful, on a sound. Kobe and San Francisco are probably very much alike, except that it's the Oriental Isn't San Francisco. I didn't see any of those. But we did manage to have dinner in someone's house in Colby somehow. And I've forgotten how. Oh, one of the interesting things that happened was on the... We finally had to take the three-day trip to Japan. And my mother was deathly ill, seasick. I was eating all the stuff that they were serving, which was the Japanese food and managed to stay well. My father managed to stay well. My mother got really sick. And somehow we found, now we were traveling, remember, third class, and third class on, in those ships is like a whole bunch of mats, and that's it. You know, no privacy whatsoever. You sleep, and you got your luggage, and everything is right in the same area. So we met somehow on that ship a European couple who turned out to be German. I doubt if at all Jewish, but German and had been to the States or something. Took pity on my mother. They were traveling first class. Took her up with them. And, you know, we struck up a friendship. And I wouldn't be surprised that it was as a result of them that we got to see a little bit of Kobe and went to someone's house. We stayed in that in Japan for two days, I think, and then we got onto our ship and left. Three. It took three days from, because we had to... No, we had to take a ship that left from up here somewhere on the peninsula all the way around instead of where we left the last time which was a six hour 
interested. Uh, the interesting thing is that those people, one day Bubby is standing in her store right here on Church Street in Hartford, and in walks a woman, and Bubby looks at her, and she looks familiar to her somehow. They strike up a conversation. Her husband is now teaching at Trinity College. They wound up, we met him, you know, like years back on this ship, and they wound up in Hartford, and so did we. He was a, tra he was a German refugee, not Jewish, I believe, wound up teaching at Trinity College, a college professor in those days, too. And you got to remember that in Europe, in Europe, royalty and people of profession are considered the same. Uh, one of the interesting things is, for instance, in Austria, uh, if a woman is married to a doctor, they call her Frau Doktor. She gets the honorary title of her husband. And the same thing with uh, lawyers and, and so forth, so that the, the professions and college teachers and so forth are really looked up to. There's a, there's a much greater class distinction and caste system there. We get onto the ship, and this is now a 14-day trip contemplated, I believe, on this ship. And the trip is relatively uneventful until we get about a day and a half, two days outside of Hawaii. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm on deck and I'm looking out at nothing but water and I spot two ships, two warships, one on either side of us. U.S. U.S. warships. What kind of ship? You were on a Japanese boat? We were on, a, on the Kamakura Maru, a Japanese ship. On the same, we later found out, or on, while, you know, when everybody started wondering, well, what's going on? It was an honor guard, because on this same ship were the Japanese peace envoys who came to the United States to keep us talking while they prepared to attack Pearl Harbor. The, you know, there were two guys in, in the States and they came over on that same ship that we came. We again saw Jewish hospitality. On this same ship with us was a rabbi, too, you know, who had also found his way to get across with his family. We got into Hawaii, and Americans come looking for us. Jewish community. Uh, picked us up with a station wagon. First time I ever saw a station wagon in my life. First time I ever saw a supermarket. First time I saw Jewish food in like uh, six weeks, eight, ten, probably twenty weeks. You know, they took us to a supermarket and we saw all this herring and all this went bullshit <laughs> in plain English. You know, whatever you want, you know, pick it. This is in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Is this the same organization? That not necessarily there i think it was just the hawaiian jewish community but there is a, a worldwide organization called joint i don't even know a jewish organization of uh i don't know i i have to look it up but you know i it's it's hard for someone who hasn't grown up to understand and it's even hard for my kids but you know when you walk in I don't care whether it's a Spanish Jew or a French Jew. If you find out you're Jewish, you got this common bond that's like unbelievable. You may not be able to speak the language, you know, you you grunt and so forth, but there's something about it. It's a brotherhood of suffering that you know no other people really can claim to the extent that we can. It's a common heritage of suffering, and it, it's unbelievable. I've gone, you know, when I was saying the memorial prayers after my parents, I'd go into synagogue in Chicago because I was in Chicago. And interestingly enough, Jim Ferris, my partner, goes with me. He enjoys it as much as I do because he sees, you know, you walk in and they don't care whether you're Jewish or not. You walk into a synagogue, you're one of us. Come on, you know. You gotta stay for tea and cookies and you gotta find out what do you do, how come you're here. 
But with me, they knew they'd see me get up to say the memorial prayer. They knew, but, you know, I did this in York, Pennsylvania. I did it in Chicago. I did it in other places. There's this common bond. And I think part of that is also our, the Jewish heritage teaches, you know, you've got to take care of people, not just your own. And this is part of why I think the organization is very loosely knit. But yet, you know, it's no secret how much American Jewry gives to Israel, for instance. And the United Jewish Appeal raises money for all these kinds of things. We've got, in Hartford, Russian Jewish families, you know, that we support. We bring them over, we try to get them settled, and, and you know, it's just... So anyway, I don't know who told them we were there. I think they were meeting every ship. I, you know, I don't think that they came because it was Marty Keston or his family. I think it was it was their chore that they had set themselves. This is one of the things they wanted to do. And the women, you know, they were obviously living well. And this was their thing, you know. It's like people going to the hospital to do volunteer work. And they came with the station wagon, and it kind of... It had a removable back seat, you know, and I was the mechanical kid. I had to help put the seat in because there was enough of us. And they brought us all this food, and then we went to the Jewish center. And I was, you know, it's the first time I saw a Jewish center where there was, you know, a stage and a social hall. Usually in, in Europe, there were synagogues. You know, you had a place to go and, and to pray, and that was it. You know, the business like you have here, you got to have a social hall. You can't build a synagogue unless it's got a social hall. I mean, you've got to build a stage first in case there's a promising actor in the congregation. You know, you've got to have a stage to act on. You know, it's really, when we built the synagogue on Cornwall Street, we were as much concerned with it being a social hall as we were with it being a house of worship. But it's good because it builds a community. It isn't just, you know, if prayer isn't your thing, at least you're still going there. And, you know, I saw this... What part of Hawaii is Honolulu. But they took, they treated us right. We were there for a day. They drove us all around the island. Where, you know, I saw my first banana tree and pineapple and, and, you know, all of this stuff. And it was really, you know, I was like this. You know, I'd never seen those tropical fruits growing. And, you know, and the woman said, oh, you want to stop you? They won't mind if you pick one. And you can pick a banana, I think it was, that we saw and all this. Okay, so all the time this peace and war is on there, and then we got back on the ship, and we got into San Francisco. And there's another city that is a fabulous city as far as I'm concerned. Really beautiful. And we had, there were some friends that my folks knew in San Francisco. We spent a couple of days there, you know, and we kept going to their house, and all of this and we stayed in the hotel down near in the lower part of the city and we had to take the trolley you know the trolleys what do they call them the cable cars no the cable cars up and all this and then we went so we got onto a train again and took a total of about five six days from san francisco we had to change trains in chicago you know, couldn't get a through train you know, you know, again with all the goddamn packages off and you know waiting for the connection and going from I don't remember whether we had to go from one terminal to the other and then to top it all off do we get into New York where the whole family is no we get into some place in New Jersey because we were on the Lake Erie I think or something coming across from from Chicago to the East Coast, you pull into Hackensack or Newark or someplace like that. You know, you. I know that I one time had to go up to uh, someplace in New York, uh, you know, near Pennsylvania, in the western part of the state, and I had to go from. You know, I took the train from Hartford into New York. This was when you were little. You know, I went to. Uh, Air Preheater Corporation. I remember the name of the corporation. I can't remember exactly where they are. In some place, western part of New York State, right near the border. Okay. <laughs> Speed it up, huh? 
and uh, we got off the train in, in New Jersey somewhere, and you know, the whole family was there, and the big shock was Uncle Abe, who was younger than my father, white, absolutely snow white in his hair. And Zadie, you know, was like, his hair was still all black. He, he didn't turn gray until he was in his 70s. You're all white in New Jersey? Yeah. Well, they knew what train we were coming in on, so All the time you're traveling on money from Jewish organizations, right? Uh, no, the travel money we had paid for. You know, that was part of what they let you take out. Uh -huh. And if you remember earlier, I told you that we had, uh, you know, ship tickets. Mm -hmm. And we traded the ship tickets because, the, you know, they weren't running. That was a big hassle. But we finally managed to get some of that money and apply it against travel. And yeah, and the family helped too. I mean, you know, they chipped in. I'm sure and Sally spent a good deal of money uh, helping us financially, and so did uh, my my father's family. You know, he had in those days there was Uncle Louis, and and of course, you know, they were they were not well off enough apparently to send the affidavit. So there was a cousin named Harry Keston who sent the original affidavits. Affidavit being the first step towards becoming an immigrant. You've got to get somebody in, in the United States to sponsor you. And you've got to give an affidavit which says that, you know, if these greenhorns come, you're going to, you know, you got enough to support them so they, they don't become a drag, you know, social drag. And where was, did you know where Uncle Sala was all the time? Uh, we knew that he was in England. Uh, I think we got word of that while we were in Latvia. Then when we also got word that he was in Canada, and I believe it was just before we got here, or maybe we were here already, when Aunt Sally and Uncle Itcher went up to Canada to see them in a concentration camp up there. Right, yeah, we could, oh, that's, that could very well be, because, you know, the, the laws are crazy. If you're a citizen of the United States, you know, you can go to Canada and come back in just with your, uh, with your birth certificate or something like that. If you're uh, an alien and you haven't made application for citizenship, you, know, you can go up there, you can't come back. If you want to be a citizen and if you came here on a visitor's visa, you've got to leave the country and re-enter on an immigration visa so that there are people who are today here on visitors' visas who, you know, make application and then they wind up taking a ride to Canada, you cross over the border and you come back in and then it's fine. And that's what they got to go through. you couldn't see your brother. I know. I didn't see my brother so from 1938 to maybe 1939. I forgot exactly when it was that I went to... Uh, when did you go from New York to Hartford? Uh, New York, we spent though several days. Then we went to Waterbury, to Aunt Sally's house, and I actually started school in Waterbury. Did you speak English? Very little, but Helga was in school. That's why I got out of school later than I should have, based on my age. Yeah, I. They were in seventh grade. Hadassah was in seventh grade. She spoke a little Yiddish. Helga, of course, spoke German and English. Put them in seventh grade with those two kids, you know, and it worked. You'd be surprised how fast I learned English. You know, I, I really didn't know much at all. And the, uh, oh, good grief! No, it was an American Briggs School in Waterbury. Yeah. Mr. Brophy was the principal. I never forget. Uncle Itch took me in, sat me down. Mr. Brophy, and this is, you know, the small town. It was like, great, you know, here was a guy, I felt so at ease, because you could tell, you know, that these were human beings, no longer the stern official, you know, they sat down nice and relaxed. In Vienna, everything was very formal, very structured, you know. A school principal was a man, you know, who deserved your law. Here you walk in, you know, Mr. Brophy, you know, sitting down, maybe put his feet on his desk, you know, and, Okay, kiddo, you know, and all this, and all right, you can bring him in, uh, you know, start him next Monday, and again, you, little things you remember, 
I remember Uncle Itcher saying, you know, and he was one of these guys, you could tell he was Jewish, but he spoke good English, but he had his little things, and one of the things he says, Mr. Brophy, if you don't mind, in my family we got this thing about we don't start anything important on Monday. <laughs> just like this. You can just, you know, I can just see how, you know, I never heard of it, you know, it was, it was a superstition. And would you believe to this day I got this hang-up about starting something important on Monday? Because it turned out pretty damn good to me, you know, the business of, huh? Yeah, I started on Tuesday. Mr. Brophy says, all right, let him come Tuesday, you know, that's the difference. And it was, you know, that's how I got into school. Okay, so then I stayed in Waterbury. In the meantime, my folks went back to New York and got an apartment. We came in February. Of uh, what year is it? Of 41. No. No, honey. 41. Oh, okay. Yeah, we came to the States. No, December 41 is when the war broke out with, uh, with Japan. We, we came in February of 41, all right? We were already living in Hartford at the time that the war, that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. I remember I was in the Lenox. I, you know, it was a Sunday afternoon. I had gone to the Lenox Theater, and I came out and, you know, heard the radio, and, you know, the news was full of the problem. Uh, but what happened was that the folks went back to New York because most of the family was there. They found an apartment. You know, they furnished the apartment with early American junk from all over the place. And then, you know, my father couldn't find a job and all this. In the meantime, Uncle Abe has got the hotel up in the mountains and used to be the dispatcher or the manager of the Monticello bus terminal for one of the bus companies that used to service the mountains. And in those days, that's how you went to the mountains. And nobody drove cars from New York City. It was buses. And it used to come a weekend, there was hundreds of buses dumping into the terminals. So there was a little concession stand, you know, a hot dog stand. Well, they decided this would be a good business to put my father into. So they rented the concession stand. Here I am in Waterbury, just starting to get used to things. Well, got to go help the folks around the concession stand. So my first real job in the United States was a candy butcher. I used to run around with a, you know, a case of soda and candy and cigars, cigarettes, candy, soda, you know, ice cold soda in Monticello. in Monticello, jumping on buses, running back and forth, you know, some of the stuff. My father and I didn't get along too good in the business. Oh, and before the concession really started, I had also been at Uncle Abe's and Aunt Dinah's hotel, helping out a little. Uh, yeah, I moved around like crazy there for a while. I, I, oh, I know what it was. I started school in Waterbury, then they got the apartment, and I got, I went to school in New York for a little bit. Then we moved to the mountains, and I went to school in the mountains for a while, in Monticello modern school. Man, they had a speaker in every room. The principal would get ding, ling, ling, make announcements to the whole damn school at once. Yes, you had a question. The one thing you didn't explain is how Sally wound up in Hartford High, or Waterbury, and actually had Oh, she, yeah, that could be a long story. Sally came to the United States in the 20s. She was actually married, believe it or not, to a cousin of my father's. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, and the whole family, you know, and, and everybody tried to, the story now is they all try to tell her, don't marry this guy, you know. Well, they came to the States. I think they got married in Europe still. And they got divorced. Itcher, in the meantime, is living in someplace in Waterbury or Bristol or someplace in, in you know, that part of Connecticut, married and has Hadassah. And his wife dies when Hadassah was a baby. 
So here he is, and he was a teacher in a Hebrew school. So he needed someone to take care of the house for him and so forth. And somehow he met Sally, and that's how Sally met him. She was taking care of the child in the house, and then she, they got married. Because it was the land of opportunity, and Europe was pretty, huh? Well, it was, you know, Europe wasn't so great, and, and the states looked like they had a better future, and uh, was people were... married in Europe? I think so. I think they got married in Europe and, and then went to the states. And one of the reasons why, you know, the early Jewish immigrants came over was because they were trying not to go into the Tsarist army, because they were good enough to get drafted but they weren't good enough to live like the rest of the soldiers. You know, they'd get every damn detail that was nasty, and, you know, anti-Semitism in the army was rampant. So a lot of them didn't feel that they wanted to serve. And that's how one of the first waves, or several waves, then when the Bolsheviks took over, a lot of Russian Jews came over because they didn't want to live under the Red uh, Regime. Uh, why my, I guess anti-Semitism had a great deal to do too with my father's family coming over, coming over. That plus opportunity, and of course, the reason there was very little opportunity was because there, anti-Semitism prevented opportunity, whereas here it really made less of a difference. And certainly they seem to all have done pretty well. Yes. 